the flower farm makes millions, but on the other side of the road, coins. That's what we get payback. If you talk ill about the company, that is the end of you. There's an unholy trinity between the businesses, our politicians, and government. Someone called me and said, do you realize that you could get killed? It's a whole mafia system. Corruption is everywhere. That's against the law of the country and against the international practice of uh, chemical use. It was praying all over us. The same evening I lost the child, I miscarried. This is Naivasha in Kenya. It's always been famous for its lake and its hippos, but now it's known for its flower farms. The first, a Sarian, set up here in 1982. Today, Naivasha is home to over 50 of the country's 120 flower farms. Kenya is the third largest exporter of cut flowers in the world, and if you live in Europe, you probably buy these flowers. 40% of Europe's roses come from here. But if you look closely, things are far from rosy here. We've spent five months investigating multinational flower farms in Naivasha, and what we found is deadly. The workers at the flower farms from my community, we go very early at work. We come very late. We meet the, the, the their targets. We follow the uh, instructions. But at the end, they don't pay good. Poverty is of, of high level. Second, illiteracy. People don't understand their rights. And just looking at the other side of the road is where the flower farms are. And the flower farm makes millions of money. But on the other side of the road, points. That's what we get payback. So there's riches on that side, and there's poverty on the other side. Kenyan workers make as little as $55 a month working at multinational flower farms that make millions every single year. In fact, until just a few years ago, the world's biggest multinational flower farm was based right here in Naivasha. Oh, this is Karuturi. This is where I worked uh, for 12 years. I used to harvest flowers here. In the early years, there was a lot of sexual harassment in this place. As in, if you want to be employed, you have to maybe to sleep with the manager, sleep with the, with the authorities, so that you, you get employment. On the 6th of May, 2016, the, the management called us for a meeting at the office. They said that was the last day of our working. And so tomorrow we were not supposed to report. In fact, that very minute after, after the meeting, Karaturi shut down from that day up to date. Karuturi was the biggest producer of cut roses in, in, in the world and one of the biggest companies in Kenya. The court found that Karuturi had evaded millions of dollars in taxes. So we have company A, Karuturi Global, we have company B, which is Karuturi Flower Farms in Naivasha, Kenya, then we have company C, which is Flower Express in Dubai. Company B would produce the flowers, then sell these flowers to Flower Express in Dubai at a very low price, at four to five shillings a stem. Then Flower Express in Dubai would sell these flowers to the rest of the world at a very high price. The effect of that would be Company B, Karuturi Flower Farms in Naivasha, would declare losses, in effect eroding the tax base from Kenya. They would shift their profits to Dubai. Dubai has no income tax levied on corporations. This is how companies like Karaturi evade taxes using this complex web of international shell companies that allows them to maximize profits in tax havens and keep the benefits away from Kenyan people. It does pay to be rich. And what, what we see is an ever-increasing wealth gap between the developing country and the developed country. It's terribly immoral, it's terribly unfair, and it's terribly unjust. Uh, it was a terrible day. You would see people walking out of the gate. Others were crying. Others were even running, running, I don't know, to where. Now you're jobless. You're out of job. There's no salary of that month. The school has closed down. Children are out of school. 
there's no job, and this is the only money you have, very little. And just in a few, in like, like two, three days, we had so many suicides. We had suicide cases. Just a, a young lady with two or three children, she hanged herself. After like two, three months, it was not bearable. Our, our manholes got filled, and there was nobody to, to, to remove the manholes, to clear the manholes. It was very unhealthy. Flies were all over. It was smelling. There was a lot of garbage. The people who were supposed to work at the garbage were not there. No water, no electricity, no people to pump the water, and it was terrible. Karuturi messed up in Kenya. The owner disappeared. The government could not get a hold of him. They have been unable to get Sher Karuturi to pay that bill. And funny thing, 2019, the Ethiopian government was now negotiating with the same company to offer them more land to continue farming and to continue exporting horticulture. So they have actually been granted a thousand hectares to farm different crops. Same name Karuturi, same fella, same layer, Netherlands being their domicile, showing that it is possible for them to move from one country to the next and continue using the same very exploitative, very extractive model. They are able to get away with that in most African contexts because of our laws, because of our political system. The colonial legacy is still perpetrated by the international financial architecture that allows Global North multinationals to continue taking advantage of Global South systems of cheap labor that is available in the global south. Neocolonialism is currently being perpetrated by allowing the global north to continue deriving profits, to continue repatriating resources, to continue engaging in very extractivist behavior in the global south and get away with it. Modern day slavery is a reality to the Kenyan people. You realize that the neocolonial system destroys production at home, exports business abroad, exports good jobs abroad, and continue to subju subjugate a people like the Kenyan people only on two fronts. Either you're offering almost free labor to us, or you're just, you know, a silly consumer. So where are Kenyan flower farms domiciled? Well, the system is set up so it can be hard to know. But we looked into the 91 flower farms registered with the Kenya Flower Council. We could find no public information on 28 of the farms. We found four connected to former Kenyan President Moy's family. The rest were all multinationals, including from places like Israel, India and Dubai, but mostly the Netherlands. We found at least 31 Dutch flower farms on the list. Many companies are interconnected in a complex web that makes ownership and profit unclear, and companies regularly exchange hands sometimes with devastating consequences for ordinary Kenyan workers. For somebody who is still in a flower farm, it's very difficult for him or her to show his or her face. This is for security purpose. When I'm seen giving out information, definitely I will lose my job. I worked at Oserian for 11 years. By the time Oserian was, uh, was selling to Bohemia, December 2021, the general worker was being paid um, a basic salary of 18000 When Bohemian uh, took over, uh, there was a drastic change. The salary uh, reduced to 7200 The past uh, five months, there was a problem with the, the, the gloves. They were torn, but as of now, no one can face the management and complain about that. So, who are Bohemian? the company who bought out Kenya's oldest flower farm. Public records show they are formed by Kongoni River Farm Limited, which is owned by VegPro, which has seven other farms totaling 250 hectares. VegPro is owned by Flower Exchange, which is based in Dubai with a Dutch owner. And Flower Exchange owns three other companies, Flora Delight with Dutch offices, Uhuru, and big flowers. Every single one of these are Kenyan farms, ultimately owned by the same multinational. 
they are supposed to monitor and ensure workers' rights are being maintained. But workers tell us they've been coerced into lying about working conditions. They use the word visitors are coming in the farm. They move around telling the employees that when a visitor maybe tries to ask you some questions, don't say something negative. When you talk, the manager is there, so you'll be forced at least to say something good. Because if you talk ill about the company, then definitely that is the end of you. It's just a mirror of what is happening to other companies. So we have many flower farms uh, are still flourishing within, within Ivasha. The worker, workers' conditions still very poor. Their profits still under declared. Trade misinvoicing still ongoing. And it is very clear that the same business model that worked for Karutori is probably still working for other flower farms. So what is the real impact on an economy like Kenya's when the norm is destructive tax practices that drain money and resources out of the country. An economy is made up of people. So what are the effects of this whole transaction on people? If you are involved in any harmful tax practice, you are denying the country the, the resources that they would need. It's the construction of the, of the highways, the construction of the hospital, construction of the church. We still need to develop. We do not have the resources to finance it. What do we do? We have loans. And so we then see the springing up of debt crises all over the developing world. So the impact of aggressive tax practices by multinationals is felt on every level, across the continent of Africa as a whole, for each nation state like Kenya, and ultimately for every single Kenyan, with lasting effects. In the case of Karaturi, workers are still waiting for unpaid severance money. Uh, most people who stay here, they are ex-workers of the company and they are staying here in the name of waiting their services whereby they have not been key, given the, right, the services. I need the money but uh, whoever I can claim to is the lawyer to pay. <laughs> whoever I can take my claim to, I don't see him but I need money. 20 years service. Yeah, me, I started working in Karaturi in 1998. I was a supervisor of education, handling chemicals and fertilizers at the same time. After, let's say, three to four years, everything in and out had a problem on that. But uh, I had to go for a checkup. But because they were on the side of the company, they, actually, they just give you the painkillers, but not the treatment. I took a loan, then I went to a private hospital whereby they, they examined me and saw that my chest was affected. I was being treated and up to now I'm not uh, that bad, I'm just okay because I went to a private hospital. But if I could rely on the clinic of the company, then maybe I could, uh, could have died even. Numerous doctors in Naivasha, who are either former or current employees of flower farms in the area, would only speak to us off the record. They told us their jobs and even their doctor's licenses would be at risk if they spoke on camera. In the end, one doctor agreed to answer our questions, but only if we used an actor to read out his answers. Every day, I see workers with asthma with no family history, skin conditions, eye infections, bronchitis, even pneumonia. I see dozens of respiratory cases on a daily basis. Sometimes multiple workers faint at the same time. There's a lot of pressure on us. The management calls the shots. I remember once a flower farm worker went to a private doctor with a broken arm, but my colleague in the flower farm was pressured into saying the arm wasn't broken, so the management you know, can demand the cast to come off. These things happen. If we sign off too many people as sick, the management puts us under pressure. They'll come and say, we can see you've signed a lot of sick off. Please try and regulate that. We're employed by the company at the end of the day. A lot of times our hands are tied, even though we know people are getting sick, especially from the chemicals. Back those days when uh, spraying was being done, 
for the chemicals for the flowers. There were no masks, we did not have dust coats, we did not have head scarves, we did not have gum boots. Get in touch with the chemicals that we do not really understand. Uh, people would faint as in you enter into the greenhouse and you, you feel dizzy and you faint and you come back and the, the crop is still wet and you have to wrap yourself with polythene bags and you have to go back into the field and harvest. There's something that we, we, is called a reentry board, as in the, 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 the reentry board is supposed to indicate the time that the chemical started, the time that the chemical will, will end, and the, the, the type of chemical that is being uh, applied. But now on the reentry board you just find things like XX, and nobody's there to explain. We had some chemicals that uh, were not supposed to be handled by, by, by people. And they knew very well that this one is harmful to people. So we had to hide the name. All of them were, they were wrapped. The real name of the chemical was not being seen. It was just XX, but the real name nowhere to be seen. That's against the law of the country and against the international practice of uh, chemical use because you're supposed to. to uh, this cross to the people who are using the chemicals, what chemical that they are using, what is the effects and what are the health effects that they may expect if they are using the chemicals. We have been doing the research monitoring the levels of these pesticides in the environment. We have carried research on the soil around the lake of carried research on the water, on the sediment, and even we have carried research in the fish. The concentrations is worrying, and these pesticides include like uh, DDT, endosulfan sulfate. We have aldrin, we have dehydrin, and many more. Most of these chemicals are banned by Stockholm Convention, and they are illegal to be used in the country. There are chemicals that are banned here, but what they do is they uh, repackage them so they have different trade names. I know that when I started mentioning trade names, someone called me and said, do you realize that you could get killed? Because this is a big business. It's a whole mafia system. No, I'm not scared. I know I've received many threats from big agrochemical companies telling me that you could get killed. But I said to them, if they kill me, then it will bring more attention to the issue. Maybe it's a good thing, but I guess they're cowards, so. I'm Gladys Boschule, a woman member of parliament for Wasingishu County. There's 262 chemicals that are being sold in Kenya that have been banned in Europe, the UK, and in the US. In fact, in the US, some of the pesticides are being sold here have been declared by courts of having caused people to have cancer, kidney failure, respiratory problems, and brain damage to children. I believe that the Pest Products Control Board is in bed with the agrochemical companies. There's an unholy uh, trinity between the businesses, our politicians, and government. You need political interests that can keep pushing the case for you. This has made it almost impossible for clean business to come into the global south, invest, uh, get their profits and pay their fair amount of tax. So how does this unholy alliance play out? Booker and Gesser has first-hand experience of how it works. My work with the flower companies was a bit of a disturbing experience. I managed to get business in that environment. Uh, the first thing that strikes you is the kind of talk that these people have. And you can see two different people when you're talking to them, in private or in public. First of all, they tell you, you will never do this in any, in any country, for example, in Europe. And then you ask, how is it that possible? Then they continue to open up and, and tell you how they are able to bypass that pro process. I, I learned about difficult, difficult chemicals from them. 
and they're asking Booker, do you have some contacts within the government that could help us? Because our main line is expensive, so the first thing is that, do you have a contact within that can help us bypass? Because the big politicians also collect big money from them. But if they can get a small boy, then it's much cheaper for them. I would say it is corruption at various levels. Either the government of the day protects the big internationals, which is one case, or the second is that they have liquid money, so they are able to compromise all the processes from the port to the Kenya Revenue Authority to the main public health officer there, and finally uh, get away with it without any prosecution, you know, taking place. Fisherman Benson says he's experienced the consequences of chemical use and the corruption that tries to hide it firsthand. He found dozens of dead fish floating right by the flower farms. He says they died because of illegal chemical dumping. Then I left here for Maji. Yeah, ni kusema kuwa ni kosi na uhakika ati kuwa ntapata samaki kwa wingi. Uh, kuwa idadi imekuwa chache sana na uh, size ya samaki imekuwa ndo na sana sana kama tuki penye sana elekea ni lazima niende mbali sana na flower farms you uh, samaki hazijakuwa karibu na flower farms zinaua zinapoterea juu ya hizo chemicals oh, ilikuwa 2 years ilikuwa 2019 ulikuja hapa tukiwa ka harakati yetu ya kutaka samaki tukapata samaki zimekufa Zikojuu if there are illegal chemicals being used, Corruption might be able to hide it in Kenya, but how are these flowers bypassing Europe's strict import rules? Yeah, so those are the, those are, that's a flower farm, and they are involved in export of flowers. So usually you find that they, they will use the harmful chemicals at the beginning of the growing process. But when the flowers are ready for harvest, they begin to use the safer organic pesticides so that by the time they hit the market in Europe, the residue limit is within what is required uh, by Europe. I think it's indicative of what the West thinks of Africa. For them, Africa is a market, and Africa is, to is supposed to be a producer of what they require. It doesn't matter at what cost. They want to have a perfect flower because the whole industry says, you know, if it's Valentine's, you want to give out the most beautiful rose. To get that perfect rose, remember, there's someone who has been ingesting all those chemicals as they sprayed the roses to get you that perfect rose. There are women who have miscarried who work in the flower farms on account of being exposed to these harmful chemicals. You must remember, every time you eat a perfect vegetable or, eat, or receive a perfect flower, it comes at a cost. Okay, I'm Mr. I'm Nyambura Ndongo. I used to work in flower farm. I wasn't happy with the job. It was not well paying. It was very small to survive, so many times I was surviving without food, even without lunch. I can remember vividly that day when I was not feeling well. I went to job as normal, and the sprayers were, 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 the sprayers were still in, they were spraying. And they and we were told to get in. 
and we are asking how can we get there are some they are in some meters away from us and the supervisor said so many people want this job why why are you disturbing me and we had to follow i started having health issues headaches puking that was Back then I had like 75 kgs, it went down to 50 kgs. I tried to get pregnant, but I, it, it was very impossible. I went to the doctor and he used to tell me, are you working in the flower farms? So many women are coming here complaining about the same issue. I was like, wow. There is a much higher level of reproductive problems among flower farm workers than the general population. We see that. We know it. But no proper research is being done. Erectile dysfunction, I see 10 times more from flower farm workers than the general population. Women struggling to get pregnant. And the same with miscarriages. Women working at flower farms are losing their babies at a disproportionate rate. I stayed for for like six years, trying to get pregnant. And when it happened, it never survived. My doctor told me like, like my, I, my blood circulation has so many chemicals in it. He gave me some medication to continue using them, to clean my tubes, my veins, everything. But it was bad. I worked for flower farms for eight years, and I was pregnant for my second child. They were using the tractors to, to, to spray chemicals. I was taken to hospital, and so unfortunate. I lost the child, I miscarried. So that's when I left Flower Farms. Uh, when I left Karaturi, then I decided I am not going back to the Flower Farms. So I talked to my pastor and he told me I can assist as an assistant pastor for a while. And then after some time, he, he gave me a small church. Now I'm pastoring a small church. Firstborn is Aisha Karungari. She's 16. She's in Form 2. And the other is 7 years. He's Romain Kongo in Grade 2. Now I sell foods. I found a, a place in the market. I have my own time, not managed by anybody, no chemicals. And I earn more. I can earn like five times. More. I enjoy doing what I do. So the reason why I decided to be a community volunteer is just because uh, I want to be the voice to my community. I want to speak about what the issues they go through. And especially in this area, I'm a friend to so many. They know what I do. And uh, yes, they support what I do. The same way a rose flower is allowed to bloom in the best environments, that is the same way those that come to farm in the Global South farms should only be allowed to farm and flourish in an environment that is not derivative, that is not extractive, that does not allow the best profits to be repatriated, and where the profit is made, that is where it should stay. <laughs>